I know the usefulness of reductive language. To know that I am a white male American human, that a red bird with black wings is a scarlet tanager, that a tree with white bark is a sycamore, that this is a riparian plant community, all that is helpful to a necessary kind of thought. But when I try to make my language more particular, I see that the life of this place is always emerging beyond expectation or prediction or typicality, that it is unique, given to the world minute by minute, only once. One afternoon, the last week in August, showing Kai how to throw a hatchet. One half turn and it sticks in a stump. And he recalls the hatchet head without a handle that's in the shop and go gets it and wants it for his own. There's a broken off ax handle behind the door, long enough for a hatchet. We cut it to length and take it with the hatchet head and the working hatchet to the wood block. There, I begin to shape the old handle with the hatchet and the phrase, first learned from Ezra Pound, rings in my ears. When making an axe handle, the pattern is not far off. And I say this to Kai. Look, we can shape the handle by checking the handle of the axe we cut with. And he sees. And I hear it again. It's also in Lu Ji's One Fu, 4th century AD essay on literature. It's in the preface. In making the handle of an axe, by cutting wood with an axe, the model is indeed near at hand. My teacher at Berkeley, Shur Xiang Chen, translated that and taught it years ago. And I see, Pound was an axe. Chen was an axe. I am an axe. And my son, a handle, soon to be shaping again model and tool, craft of culture, how we go on. I'm going to begin with a, a, a few newish poems and then read a prose piece and then maybe another poem. This is a poem called Longer. <clears throat> Experts are bragging now of our longevity. Stand up and take a bow, experts, for we are pleased as usual. You have, by miracles of science, prolonged our life to see catastrophes of science we'd otherwise have missed. <laughs> How sad to be unkissed by one's posterity ten generations hence. Each war we'll live to see will be the best so far. We'll live life without end and bury every friend less lucky than ourselves. And meanwhile, for our good, we'll take expensive pills and eat unseasoned food, uncomforted by fat, with no dessert, <laughs> no cream. We'll live past memory, our own or anybody's. Go down in history without our teeth or hair, <laughs> commemorating time by notches in our chair. At last, life will extend into the nursing home. We'll breathe a long time there, the television on, too weak to turn it off, <laughs> but still alive. 
Please pass the biscuits, ham and eggs. And pass the gravy, please. Cream in my coffee? Yes. And now that we have ate, you got a cigarette? song of himself. With his new girlfriend, Erica, he's driving through America <laughs> at the most place-effacing pace, impatient of substance, time, and space. He sings of Erica's body, young, the only substance of his song, his shoddy song of Erica, his measure of America, his newfound land, newfound by him, a placeless space, a dayless time. The future. For God's sake be done with this jabber of a better world. What blasphemy. No projectifying bitch or son thereof ever in embodied light will see a better world than this, though they foretell inevitably a worse. Do something. Go cut the weeds beside the oblivious road. Pick up the cans and bottles, old tires, and dead predictions. No future can be stuffed into this presence except by being dead. The day is clear and bright, and overhead, the sun not yet half finished with his daily praise. And this is a, um, a, a, a new Sabbath poem, which like most of them doesn't have a title. There is a place you can go where you are quiet, a place of water and the light on the water. Trees are there, leaves, and the light on leaves moved by air. Birds singing move among leaves in leaf shadow. After many years you have come to no thought of these, but they are themselves your thoughts. There seems to be little to say, less and less. Here they are, here you are, here as though gone. None of us stays but the hush where each leaf in the speech of leaves is a sufficient syllable. The passing light finds out surpassing freedom of its way. And now I'm going to read a um, passage of prose from a book called Life is a Miracle, an essay against modern superstition. And a part of my work in this book is to try to undermine the uh, a part of scientific authority that I think is illegitimate or superstitious. And this, is, this part deals um, with reduction. There obviously is a necessary usefulness in the processes of reduction. They are indispensable to scientists and to the rest of us as well. It is valuable sometimes to know the parts of a thing and how they are joined together to know what things do and do not have in common, and to know the laws or principles by which things cohere, live, and act. Such inquiries are native to human thought and work. But reductionism also has one inherent limitation that is paramount, and that is abstraction. Its tendency to allow the particular to be absorbed or obscured by the general. 
It is a curious paradox of science that its empirical knowledge of the material world gives rise to abstractions such as statistical averages which have no materiality and exist only as ideas. There is, empirically speaking, no average and no type. Between the species and the specimen, the creature itself, the individual creature, is lost. Having been classified, dissected, and explained, the creature has disappeared into its class, anatomy, and explanation. The tendency is to equate the creature or its habitat with one's formalized knowledge of it. The uniqueness of an individual creature is inherent not in its physical or behavioral anomalies, but in its life. Its life is not its life history, the typical cycle of members of its species from conception to reproduction to death. Its life is all that happens to it in its place. Its wholeness is inherent in its life, not in its physiology or biology. This wholeness of creatures and places together is never going to be apparent to an intelligence coldly determined to be empirical or objective. It shows itself to affection and familiarity. Science speaks properly a language of abstraction and abstract categories when it is properly trying to sort out and put in order the things it knows. But it often assumes improperly that it has said or known enough when it has spoken of the cell or the organism, the genome or the ecosystem, and given the correct scientific classification and name. Carried too far, this is a language of false specification and pretentious exactitude, never escaping either abstraction or the cold-heartedness of abstraction. The giveaway is that even scientists do not speak of their loved ones in categorical terms as a woman, a man, a child, or a case. Affection requires us to break out of the abstractions, the categories, and confront the creature itself in its life, in its place. The importance of this for conservation can hardly be overstated. For things cannot survive as categories, but only as individual creatures living uniquely where they live. We know enough of our own history by now to be aware that people exploit what they have merely concluded to be of value, but they defend what they love. To defend what we love, we need a particularizing language, for we love what we particularly know. The abstract, objective, impersonal, dispassionate language of science can, in fact, help us to know certain things and to know some things with certainty. It can help us, for instance, to know the value of species and of species diversity, but it can't help us much to save even those things to which it can assign a value. The abstractions of science are too readily assimilable to the abstractions of industry and commerce, which see everything as interchangeable with or replaceable by something else. There is a kind of egalitarianism which holds that any two things equal in price are equal in value, and that nothing is better than anything that may profitably or fashionably replace it. Forest equals field equals parking lot. If the price of alteration is right, then there is no point in quibbling over differences. One place is as good as another, one use is as good as another, one life is as good as another, if the price is right. Thus, political sentimentality metamorphoses into commercial indifference or aggression. This is the the industrial doctrine of the interchangeability of parts and we apply it to places, to creatures, and to our fellow humans as if it were the law of the world, using all the while a sort of middling language imitated from the sciences 
that cannot speak of heaven or earth, but only of concepts. This is a rhetoric of nowhere, which forbids a passionate interest in, let alone a love of, anything in particular. Directly opposed to this reduction or abstraction of things is the idea of the preciousness of individual lives and places. This does not come from science, but from our cultural and religious traditions. It is not derived, and it is not derivable, from any notion of egalitarianism. If all are equal, none can be precious. We now have the phenomenon of mitigation banking, by which a developer may purchase the right to spoil one place by preserving another. Science can measure and balance acreages in this way just as cold-heartedly as commerce. Developers involved in such trading undoubtedly have the assistance of ecologists. Nothing insists that one place is not interchangeable with another except affection. If the people who live in such places and love them cannot protect them, nobody can protect them. I have to remind you now that I'm reading an essay, not a lecture. <laughs> I've been working this morning in front of a window where I've been at work on many mornings for 37 years. Though I have been busy today, as always, I've been aware of what has been happening beyond the window. The ground is whitened by patches of melting snow. The river, swollen with the runoff, is swift and muddy. I saw four wood ducks riding the current, apparently for fun. A great blue heron was fishing, standing in water up to his belly feathers. Through binoculars, I saw him stoop forward, catch and swallow a fish. At the feeder on the windowsill, goldfinches, titmice, chickadees, nuthatches, and cardinals have been busy at a heap of free to them sunflower seeds. A flock of crows has found something newsworthy in the cornfield across the river. The woodpeckers are at work, and so are the squirrels. Sometimes from this outlook, I have seen wonders, deer swimming across the river, wild turkeys feeding, a pair of newly fledged owls, otters at play, a coyote taking a stroll, a hummingbird feeding her young, a peregrine falcon eating a snake. When the trees are not in leaf, I can see the wooded slopes on both sides of the valley. I have known this place all my life. I long to protect it and the creatures who belong to it. During the 37 years I've been at work here, I've been thinking a good part of the time about how to protect it in such places. This is a small, fragile place a slender strip of woodland between the river and the road. I know that in two hours a bulldozer could make it unrecognizable to me and perfectly recognizable to every developer. The one thing that I know above all is that even to hope to protect it, I have got to break out of all the categories and confront it as it is. I must be present in its presence. I know at least some of the categories and value them and have found them useful. But here I am in my life, and I know that I am not here as a representative white male American human, nor are the birds and animals and plants here as representatives of their sex or species. We all have our ways, forms, and habits. We all are what we are partly because we're here and not in another place. Some of us are mobile. Some of us, such as the trees, have to be content merely to be flexible. All of us who are mobile are required by happenstance and circumstance and accident to make choices that are not instinctive and that force us out of categories into our lives here and now. Even the trees are under this particularizing influence of place and time. 
each one responding to happenstance and circumstance and to accident, has assumed a shape not quite like that of any other tree of its kind. The trees stand rooted in their mysteriously determined places, no place quite like any other, in strange finality. The birds and animals have their nests in holes and burrows and crotches, each one's place a little unlike any other in the world. And so is the nest my mate and I have made. In all of the 37 years I have worked here, I have been trying to learn a language particular enough to speak of this place as it is and of my being here as I am. My success, as I well know, has been poor enough, and yet I am glad of the effort, for it has helped me to make and to remember always the distinction between reduction and the thing reduced. I know the usefulness of reductive language. To know that I am a white male American human, that a red bird with black wings is a scarlet tanager, that a tree with white bark is a sycamore, that this is a riparian plant community, all that is helpful to a necessary kind of thought. But when I try to make my language more particular, I see that the life of this place is always emerging beyond expectation or prediction or typicality, that it is unique, given to the world minute by minute, only once, never to be repeated. And then is when I see that this life is a miracle, absolutely worth having, absolutely worth saving. We are alive within mystery by miracle. Life, wrote Erwin Shargaff, is the continual intervention of the inexplicable. We have more than we can know. We know more than we can say. The constructions of language, which is to say the constructions of thought, are formed with inexperience, not the other way around. Finally, we live beyond words, as also we live beyond computation and beyond theory. In speaking of the reductionism of modern science, we should not forget that the primary reduction is in the assumption that human experience or human meaning can be adequately represented in any human language. This assumption is false. To show what I mean, I will give the example that is most immediate to my mind. My grandson, who is four years old, is now following his father and me over some of the same countryside that I followed my father and grandfather over. When his time comes, my grandson will choose as he must, but so far we all have been farmers. I know from my grandfather that when he was a child, he too followed his father in this way, hearing and seeing, not knowing yet that the most essential part of his education had begun. And so, in this familiar spectacle of a small boy tagging along behind his father across the fields, we're part of a long procession, five generations of which I have seen, issuing out of generations lost to memory, going back for all I know across previous landscapes and the whole history of farming. Modern humans tend to believe that whatever is known can be recorded in books or on tapes or on computer disks and then again learned by those artificial means. But it is increasingly plain to me that the meaning, the cultural significance, even the practical value of this sort of family procession across a landscape can be known but not told. These things, though they have a public value, do not have a public meaning. They are too specific to a particular place and history. This is exactly the tragedy in the modern displacement of people and cultures. That such things can be known but not told can be shown by answering a simple question. Who 
knows the meaning, the cultural significance, and the practical value of this rural family's generational procession across its native landscape? The answer is not so simple as the question. No one person ever will know all the answer. My grandson certainly does not know it, and my son does not, though he has positioned himself to learn some of it, should he be so blessed. I am the one who, to some extent, knows, though I know also that I cannot tell it to anyone living. I am in the middle now between my grandfather and my father, who are alive in my memory, and my son and my grandson, who are alive in my sight. If my son, after 30 more years have passed, has the good pleasure of seeing his own child and grandchild in that procession, then he will know something like what I now know. This living procession through time, in a place, is the record by which such knowledge survives and is conveyed. When the procession ends, so does the knowledge. And I'm going to end with a little poem, another uh, recent Sabbath poem. We travelers walking to the sun can't see ahead. When we look back, the very light that blinded us shows us the way we came, along which blessings now appear, risen as if from sightlessness to sight. And we go on by blessing brightly lit toward that blessed light that yet to us is dark. I'm going to read a little essay first uh, called Entering the 50th Millennium. It's a recent essay. Uh, and it touches on two territories uh, that I think are uh, of interest to all of us. One of them is the millennium. You all know about that. Uh, and uh, another aspect of this essay is, uh, which is a very much in the presence of people here uh, on the Colorado Plateau, is prehistory, archaeology, uh, deep history, uh, stories from the past uh, that we're all still trying to understand. This is about more of those stories. It's called Entering the 50th Millennium. Let us say that we are about to enter not the 21st century, the third millennium, but the 50th millennium. Since the various cultural calendars, Hindu, Jewish, Islamic, Christian, Japanese, etc., are each told within terms of their own stories, we can ask, what calendar would be suggested to us by the implicit narrative of contemporary Euro-American science? Since that is what provides so much of our contemporary worldview. So we might come up with a Homo sapiens calendar that would start at about 40,000 years ago, before the present, BP, uh, in what is called the Gravetian Ornacian era, at a time when the human toolkit, which had already long been sophisticated, began to be decorated with graphs and emblems that's the time when figurines were produced, not for practical use, but apparently for magic and beauty. That's a kind of a watershed there. Rethinking our calendar in this way is made possible by the research and discoveries of the last century in physical anthropology, paleontology, archaeology, and cultural anthropology, last century and this century. The scholars of hominid history are uncovering a constantly larger past in which the earlier members of our species continually appear to be smarter, more accomplished, more adept, and more complex than we had previously believed. 
So we humans are constantly revising the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. The main challenge in this is to keep this unfolding story modestly reliable. One of my neo-pagan friends, an ethnobotanist and paleohistorian, complains about how the Christians have callously appropriated his sacred solstice ceremonies. He says, our fir tree of lights and gifts has been swept into an orgy of consumerism, no longer remembered as a sign of the return of the sun. And he says, people have totally forgotten that the gifts brought from the north by Santa Claus are spiritual, not material. And his red clothes, white trim, round body, and northern habitat show that he represents the psychoactive mushroom Amanita muscaria. <laughs> Makes sense when you think of it. <laughs> My friend is one of several poet scholars I know who study deep history, a term that he prefers to prehistory. And in this case, what I'm going to talk about tonight, that of Europe, for clues and guides to understanding the creature that we are and how we got here, the better to steer our way into the future. And such studies are especially useful for artists. My wife and I went to France several summers ago to pursue an interest in the Upper Paleolithic. Southwest Europe has large areas of limestone karst plateau which allows for caves by the thousands, some of them enormous. Quite a few of these caves were decorated by Upper Paleolithic people. With the help of the poet and the paleo art historian, Clayton Eshelman, Carol and I visited many sites and saw a major sampling of the cave art of Southwest Europe in the Dordogne and in the Pyrenees. Places like Peshmero, Cunyac, Niol, El Portel, the famous Lascaux, and Trois Frères, where the great antlered dancing shaman figure is found at the very farthest end of the cave. The cave art with its finger tracings, engravings, hand stencils, outline drawings, and polychrome paintings flourished from 10,000 to 35,000 years ago. The Paleolithic cave and portable art of Europe thus constitutes, from 35,000 to 10,000 years ago, a 25,000 year continuous artistic and cultural tradition. The people who did this were fully homo sapiens, and it must be clearly stated, not just the ancestors of the people of Europe, but in a gene pool that old, to some degree, ancestors to everyone everywhere. The art that they left us is a heritage for the people of the whole world. This tradition is full of puzzles. The artwork is often placed far back in the caves in almost inaccessible places. The quality fluctuates wildly. Animals can be painted with exquisite attention, but there are relatively few human figures, and the ones that are there are strangely crude. Almost no plants are represented. Birds and fish are scarce compared to mammals, with one cave as an exception. Some animal paintings, as in Niol, appear unfinished, commonly with the feet left off. The theories and explanations from the 20th century cave art specialists, the great Abbe Bruya and the redoubtable André Leroy Gourhan, don't quite work. The hunting magic theory, which holds that the paintings of animals were to increase the take in the hunt, is contradicted by the fact that the majority of animal horses are uh, animal pictures are of wild horses, which were in fact not a big food item, and that the animals most commonly consumed, which were red deer and reindeer, are depicted in small number. The horse was not yet domesticated, so why this fascination for horses? My wife Carol suggests that maybe the artists were a guild of teenage girls. <laughs> the bison is a close second, however, and 
was a food source, the European bison. The other most commonly represented animals, the huge Pleistocene bison and the auroch, a huge boss, that's cattle, which was living in the forests of northwestern Europe up until the 16th century, were apparently too large and too dangerous to be major hunting prey. Ibex, chamois, and the panther occasionally show up, but they were not food items. There are also many pictures of animals long extinct now. Woolly rhinoceros, mammoth, cave bear, giant elk. In the art of early civilized times, there was a fascination with large predators. In particular, the charismatic Anatolian lions and the brown bears, from which the word Arctic derives. Big predators were abundant in the Paleolithic, but sketches or paintings of them are scarce in all caves but one. It was the bears who first used the caves and entirely covered the walls of some, like Rufignac, with long scratches. Seeing this may have given the first impetus to humans to do their own graffiti. So we may have been taught to write by bears. <laughs> the word grammar, if you trace it back far enough, goes to a word that means scratches. Then there's another theory, that, the <laughs> that these works were part of a shamanistic and ceremonial cultural practice, which, though likely enough, can only be speculation. There have also been attempts to read narratives out, out of certain graphic combinations to see if they were telling stories. But that, too, seems to lead nowhere. After several decades of research and comparison, it came to seem to the archaeologists and the art historians that cave art began with hand stencils and crude engravings starting around 32,000 years before the present. Progressively, the, then the theory was, they progressively, progressively evolved through time, leading to an artistic climax at Lascaux. This, the most famous of caves, discovered during World War II, is generally felt to contain the most lovely and remarkable of all the world's cave art. These polychrome paintings are dated at around 17,000 years before the present. That summer, I had the rare good fortune to be admitted to Le Frey Grotte of Lascaux, as well as the replica, which is where most tourists are shunted now, uh, which is in itself excellent and what all but a handful of people now see. I can testify to the magic of Lascaux. There is an 18-foot-long painting of an auric cow arcing across a ceiling 12 feet above the floor. A sort of Lascaux style is then perceived as coming down in other later caves, excellent work, up to the Salon Noir in the Neo cave in the Ariège, dated at about 11,500 years before now. After about 10,000 years ago, cave art simply stops being made. Many of the caves closed up from landslides and cave-ins, and the whole tradition was forgotten. Until quite recently, everyone was pretty comfortable with the theoretical evolutionary chronology, which fits our contemporary wish to believe that things get better through time. But then in 94, 1994, some enthusiastic speleologists found a new cave on the Ardèche River, a tributary of the Rhône. Squeezing through narrow cracks, not expecting much, they almost tumbled into a 50-foot-high hall and a quarter mile of passageways of linked chambers full of magnificent depictions that were the equal of anything at Lascaux. There are a few animals shown here that are totally new to cave art, Images of woolly rhinoceros and the Pleistocene maneless lion, which are rare in other caves, are the most numerous. This site is known now after one of its lead discoverers as the Chauvet Cave. The French scientists did their initial carbon dating, were puzzled, 
looked again and had to conclude that these marvelous paintings were around 32,000 years old, 15,000 years older than those at Lascaux. Almost as distant in time from the Lascaux paintings as Lascaux is from us. The idea of a progressive history, of a progressive history to cave art is seriously in question. And a new and again larger sense of the Homo sapiens story has opened up for us, and the beginnings of art are pushed even further back in time. I wrote in my notebook, out of the turning and twisting calcined cave walls, a sea of fissures, calcite concretions, stalactites, old claw, old claw scratchings of cave bears, floors of bear wallows and bear slides, then the human finger tracings in clay, early scribblings scratched in lines, sketchy little engravings of half-done creatures or just abstract signs, lines crossed over lines, images done over images. Out of this ancient swirl of graffiti rise up the exquisite figures of animals, swimming deer with their antlers cocked up, a pride of lions with noble profiles, fat wild horses, great-bodied bison, huge-horned wild bulls, antlered elk, painted and powerfully outlined creatures alive with the life that art gives on the long-lost mineraled walls below ground. Crisp, economical, swift, sometimes hasty, fitting into the space, fitting right over other paintings, spread across, outlined in calligraphic, confident, curving lines. Not photorealistic, but true. To have done this, I think, took a mind that could clearly observe and hold within it a wealth of sounds, smells, and images, and then carry them underground and recreate them. The effort itself took organization and planning to bring off. We have found the stone lamps, evidence of lighting supplies, traces of ground pigments, sometimes obtained from very far away. And the people must have had gathered supplies of food, dried grass for bedding, poles for scaffolding. The scaffolding poles in Lascaux left behind notches in the cave wall. You can see where the scaffolding was set. Someone was doing arts administration, <laughs> which now looks like maybe rather than that other famous ancient occupation, man's earliest occupation. <laughs> and there may be no progress, as there seems to have not been any definable progress in cave art, for the literary arts as well. And there may be no progress in religion, in practice, or in the Dharma either. There was the ancient Buddha. There were archaic bodhisattvas. All that we have to study of them is shards and paintings. What was the future? One answer might be, the future was to have been further progress and improvement over present conditions. This is more in question now. The deep past confounds the future by suggesting how little we are agreed on what is good. And if our ancient rock arts artists skipped out on painting human beings, it just may be that they knew more than enough about themselves and could turn their attention wholeheartedly to the non-human other. The range of their art embraces both abstract and unreadable signs and graphs and a richly portrayed world of what today we would call faunal biodiversity. They gave us a picture of their animal environment with as much pride and art as if they were giving us 
their very selves. Maybe in some way they speak from a spirit that is in line with Dogen's comment. We study the self to forget the self. When you forget the self, you can become one with all the other phenomena. We have no way of knowing what the religious practices, the rituals, or the verbal art of 35,000 years ago might have been. It is most likely that the languages of that time were in no way inferior in complexity, sophistication, or richness to the languages spoken today. I get this opinion in a recent personal communication from the eminent linguist William Bright. It's not far-fetched to think that if the paintings were so good, the poems and songs must have been of equal quality. One can imagine myths and tales of people, places, and animals being told back then. In poetry and song, I fancy them singing wild horse chants, salutes, as are sung in some parts of Africa, to each creature each day, each time it is first seen. Little lyrics that intensify some element in the narrative, a kind of deep song, cante hondo, to go together with deep history. Or, on the other side, maybe lots of quick little bison haiku. <laughs> it was all in the realm of orality, which, as we well know, can support a rich and intense literary culture, and one which is often interacting with dance, song, and story. Such are our prime so-called high culture arts today, opera and ballet. Today, then, this Franco-Germanic Anglian Creole called English has become the world's second language, has become everybody's second language, and as such is a major bearer of diverse literary cultures. English is and will be all the more a future host to a truly multicultural rainbow realm of writings. The rich history of the English language tradition is like a kiva full of lore to be studied and treasured by writers and scholars wherever they may find themselves on the planet. It will also continue, as all languages do, to diversify and to embrace words and pronunciations that will move it farther and farther from London town. Even as I deliberately take my membership to be North American, and I feel distant from most of European culture, I count myself fortunate to have been born a native speaker of English. Such flexibility, such variety of vocabulary, such a fine sound system. But of course, everybody loves their own language. We can look forward to its future changes. And performance, poetry, storytelling, and fiction are always going to be alive and well. Orality and song will stay with poetry as long as humans are here. So within, we might wonder through what images our voices, our lives, our practices, through what images will they carry to the people 10,000 years from now? Through the swirls, maybe, of still standing freeway off ramps and on ramps mysterious temples, or through the ruins of dams. For those future people will surely be there listening for some faint call from us when they are entering the 60th millennium. Thank you. I'm going to read a couple of poems then to finish. Uh, 
axe handles, uh, a poem about handing on culture from fathers to sons. One afternoon, the last week in August, showing Kai how to throw a hatchet. One half turn and it sticks in a stump. And he recalls the hatchet head without a handle that's in the shop and go gets it and wants it for his own. There's a broken off axe handle behind the door, long enough for a hatchet. We cut it to length and take it with the hatchet head and the working hatchet to the wood block. There, I begin to shape the old handle with the hatchet. And the phrase, first learned from Ezra Pound, rings in my ears. When making an axe handle, the pattern is not far off. And I say this to Kai. Look, we can shape the handle by checking the handle of the axe we cut with. And he sees. And I hear it again. It's also in Lu Ji's One Fu, 4th century AD essay on literature. It's in the preface. In making the handle of an axe, by cutting wood with an axe, the model is indeed near at hand. My teacher at Berkeley, Shi Xiang Chen, translated that and taught it years ago. And I see, Pound was an axe. Chen was an axe. I am an axe. And my son, a handle, soon to be shaping again model and tool, craft of culture, how we go on. I see mountains constantly walking, a poem for Seamus Haney. coming out of a trip to Ireland to do a poetry reading uh, a few years ago. In Dublin, Trinity University, there are two libraries. One is the contemporary working library uh, for the students and the faculty. The other, in what is called the Long Hall, uh, is a marvelously preserved 18th century library that has been left intact with all of these rows of stacks of folio-sized, leather-bound uh, 18th century books. Uh, it's called the Great Hall. It's darn near as long as a football field, or at least it seems that way. Uh, it is the database of Western culture as of the 18th century. All the information for, uh, that was at hand for them is in that library today. Uh, and when you fly to Ireland or England, when you fly to the British Isles, often your route takes you over Greenland. If you're lucky, you get over Greenland when it's light. I see mountains constantly walking. Work took me to Ireland, a 12-hour flight. The river, Liffey, ale in a bar. So many stories of passions and wars, a hilltop stone tomb with the wind across the door. Peat swamps go by, people of the Ice Age. Endless fields and farms, the last 2,000 years. I read my poems in Galway, just the chirp of a bug, and flew home thinking of literature and time the serried rows of books in the long hall at Trinity, the ranks of stony ranges above the ice of Greenland. Thank you. Place is by one definition an autobiographical issue and you have both been described as writers of place. Certainly places have animated your imaginations yet each of you seem to have dealt quite differently with the matter. Wendell, you first. You went away from home in Kentucky, off to college, then to graduate school at Stanford as a writing fellow and landed in New York City. 
Perhaps like many of your generation in the South, you seemed launched away from your home. You've written about the drain of people from rural communities that began after the Second World War, and perhaps you were simply part of that drain, a drain that might have seemed required to have a life of the imagination. But in fairly short order, you returned to a farm not far from your parents' home place in Henry County, Kentucky. What was first involved in that adventure of leaving, and what turned you around and sent you home? Well, at this uh, uh, distance, I can't really take credit for much of anything except instinct. I, um, I think um, that the return happened because Tanya and I both wanted to, to return, and um, I did very much. And I think the, uh, that it was a justifiable thing to do as I can see now in, in uh, retrospect, because I had belonged to this place uh, all my life, or most of it, uh, well, really all of it. I'd belonged to it even when I was somewhere else. And this was going, obviously, to, be, to have to be my subject. And uh, as a writer, but I can see now that there's a problem about turning your subject into subject matter uh, as if it were some kind of raw material that didn't have any dignified existence until you uh, took it over and made something of it. <laughs> and it seems to me that uh, living in your subject keeps you well advised <laughs> that your subject has uh, respectability and a dignity uh, quite apart from anything that you're going to to make of it. Also in retrospect it seems to me that if I had stayed away I would have continued to write about that I would have made it sub made it into subject matter and I would have uh, falsified it. I would have uh, become wrong about it in some some um, seriously debilitating way. <laughs> you, you always had a kind of farming instinct. I remember you saying that when you were in Manhattan, you had a couple of goldfish. I did. <laughs> I bought a, uh, an aquarium and, uh, and some fish, and it's the most, uh, the oddest thing I ever did in my life. <laughs> um, but I had. Um, been taught by my father and others to, to love livestock and to, <laughs> to need to be around it. So I suppose that was the, the operative uh, instinct in that case. I was a very strange young man in some ways. Gary, uh, from a rural home in Washington, in a depression left-wing household. You traveled as a young man and went to Reed College and then to the San Francisco Bay Area, apparently all along on your way to Japan. Kyoto must have seemed as far from home as you could imagine. But then after 15 or more years on the road, you returned to Homestead in the Sierra foothills where you've remained for 30 years. What was happen happening in your life with all that travel? And then what changed when you broke ground at Kit Kit Dizzy? In my first uh, 11 years or so, uh, I was on a farm uh, up north of Seattle, uh, a little orchard, some milk cows, quite a flock of chickens. Uh, and I, uh, I very much liked that life, uh, although people tell me that it was a hard life and that it was the Depression then, um, which I never noticed. Uh, but World War II came along and unsettled our family as it unsettled so many others. Uh, I don't know quite exactly what went down, but the farm got sold, uh, and my parents moved to Portland, Oregon, where uh, my dad got a job, the first job he'd had in seven or eight years. Uh, and I found myself uh, somewhat at loose ends in the world uh, after having been very closely bonded to one place. Uh, I took up mountaineering and backpacking and forestry work. Uh, and came to find uh, the forests and the mountains of the West Coast 
uh, as sort of my territory on a somewhat larger scale than uh, just a few hundred acres. Uh, it gave me uh, something to call home. Uh, and my first uh, long journey was hitchhiking to New York when I was 18. Uh, I discovered you could go places by hitchhiking. Uh, and once I started that, I traveled a lot uh, between 18 and 25, <laughs> all over the continent a number of times. Uh, so somehow that was also on my way to Japan, but I didn't quite know it you know, until I actually set foot on the ship. Uh, in all of those travels, I never uh, lost my sense of being a person of the forests and mountains of the West Coast. That was something I could relate to because I knew what it was. I had a sense of what the climate, the smells, the critters, and the jobs were. It's partly it's economic. I used to make my living doing that kind of work. Uh, and I never uh, thought at any time, even though I spent 12 years in East Asia, uh, that I would ever stay there. Uh, so it was like going away to go to school. Uh, in this case, the schooling was Zen Buddhist training. Uh, always with the sense that I would return to Turtle Island, North America, and uh, find out whatever chores there were to be done over on this side of the Pacific. Uh, but moving around like that, uh, eight months on a uh, tanker also, crossing the Pacific a number of times and going into the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, was like biogeographic education. And uh, I was always on the outlook to learn more about the birds, the place, the weather, the smells, the stars. Getting to see the stars of the Southern Hemisphere was so exciting. You know, and to get in line with the, the, the Southern Cross. Uh, uh, but I took that also, although I wouldn't have said this articulately to myself at that time, uh, I was enlarging my sense of place in as valid a way as you can enlarge your sense of place, and that is by a lot of first-hand experience and paying attention to it. Uh, it had always been in my mind to settle down someplace again, uh, and uh, which seems normal. It, seems, it always has seemed to me like that's what human beings do, is they live somewhere. Uh, <laughs> even though they travel, they go on trips, but they live somewhere. Uh, so I ran onto a piece of land which I identified as livable uh, by the community that was there. Uh, some ponderosa pine, black oak, madrone, manzanita, uh, sugar pine. Even though it was the first time I had ever been on that particular mountainside, I said, oh, I know these guys. I know what kind of weather they require, what kind of rain they call in, and what kind of birds and other creatures are going to be around. I can live here. And so that was then an easy choice. And uh, uh, it's been a marvelous practice ever since to keep on learning about being in one spot where I am not all the time. You know, I'm here. Uh, uh, Drum Hadley, whom some of you may know, and I were once walking along a, uh, a, a spongy tundra up in Alaska. And Drum was saying, God, this is exciting, but it feels a little wrong. <laughs> he says, it's like, it's like sort of being on the verge of getting in bed with a woman you're not married to. You know, I said, you mean you're feeling about the landscape drum? He says, yeah. He says, it's, it's kind of like transgressive to be enjoying a new and different landscape. <laughs> I thought that was very sensitive of him. <laughs> uh, and I, I pondered that a lot. And I, I finally came to my own kind of risque solution, which is I'm monogamous in marriage and promiscuous with landscapes. <laughs> that's having it both ways. <laughs> Wendell said, that's having it both ways. <laughs> well, another um, personal and autobiographical matter is religion. And let me start with Gary first this time. You were raised, I believe, in a libertarian agnostic household. 
and the atmosphere of rebellion against certain things common in American life must have begun two generations before yours. I recall in the late 60s, um, the, um, after a reading of Brother Antoninus in Santa Barbara, you were furious, saying something to me like, that's exactly what we've been fighting against all this time. And an element of the counterculture, at the beginning at least, was a palpable antagonism toward Christianity. And yet from the beginning you talked about values, archaic values, the spiritual practices of native peoples, and very early on you began a serious practice of Zen Buddhism, first on your own and then in Japan in a proper monastic temple setting. Do you remember how you first heard of Zen? What did you find attractive about that form of spirituality? And it's certainly more vigorous and demanding than what is passed for common Christian practice in America, um, hierarchical at all. Uh, how has Zazen and Buddhism worked in your life? Well, you don't ask any little questions. <laughs> I only have four. You only have four like that, huh? scoreboard to answer questions like that. Well, first tell me how you heard about Zen, because I've never well, asked you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell it in a slightly different sequence. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my first uh, glimpse of uh, some kind of nutty spirituality uh, was in snow, snow Peak Mountain Climbing. I started climbing when I was about 15. Uh, that, was, that was the summer I climbed Mount St. Helens, uh, which was then a 9,000-foot high volcano. Uh, and I'll tell you a little funny story about that. The next day after we climbed that mountain, there was a newspaper posted at the Forest Service Ranger Station down there by Spirit Lake, and the headlines were, Atomic Bomb Dropped on Japan. Uh, and I stood there, that was summer 45, I stood there and I read those headlines, and then I read the article, which said, scientists say that nothing will ever grow again in Hiroshima for maybe 100 years. That's what they were predicting then. So. I was so outraged that I said, I swear by this beautiful, permanent Mount St. Helens that I will oppose this atomic evil. <laughs> no, so Hiroshima looks great now, and Mount St. Helens is blown half away. <laughs> uh, that and my uh, inborn, I guess, karmically inborn love of nature and uh, time spent in the woods gave me a, a, a sense of the moral, the moral importance of non-human nature uh, and uh, alienated me from uh, Sunday school. Uh, so <laughs> they, said, they said my heifer wouldn't go to heaven, which outraged me again. Uh, but then I heard, I heard little whispers of Buddhism somewhere and uh, one of the things that impressed me about it was Buddhism and Hinduism was that their, uh, their ethic included the non-human world uh, and uh, took all of uh, all living beings and in some cases maybe non-living beings into the fold of their concern. Uh, that put me on alert uh, so that when I ran on to uh, my beginnings of Buddhist studies uh, I was uh, attentive to it. Uh, and then, discovering Zen a little later, probably not until I was 19 or 20, uh, I loved the art and the poetry, and then with my mountaineering uh, sense of pain is pleasure uh, and danger is fun, uh, Zen seemed really attractive. <laughs> uh, when I first met you, Wendell, I sensed that you too were involved in a measure of rebellion against the Christian practices of your community. I, um, I recall you saying that you'd never been able to join a church, and for a long time you seemed to avoid the vocabulary of Christianity. You've been a critic of the church, and you've had, and yet you, and you've had close friendships with Buddhists and humanists, apparently having great respect for those traditions. Have you come to feel more comfortable with Christianity? Christian stories and values seem more apparent in your writing than ever before. Would you describe yourself as a Christian writer now? And has your sense of spiritual matters changed over the years? I didn't think Gary finished answering his question.
<laughs> well, I suppose that, uh, that I have to begin this answer by saying that I have not ever been a, uh, a person very comfortable in organizations. I never liked church very much, and I never liked school very much. And um, I suppose if I'd ever worked for the government, I wouldn't have liked the government. <laughs> Uh, very much. As it is, I just have an amateur discomfort with government. <laughs> um, I never, the, the uh, religion available to me was um, uh, Protestant Christianity, evan evangelical Protestantism. And I've never been comfortable with evangelism. I never cared uh, very much for the, um, or I've, I've come to realize that for a very long time I've been uncomfortable with the body-soul dualism, the uh, heaven and earth dualism, the spirit and matter dualism, uh, and I've um, taken a pledge that I won't use those, especially the spirit and matter dualism anymore. I don't like to use the word spirit and spirituality if I can help it. Um, I didn't like the uh, don't like the church's dissociation from economic issues. Um, I don't like the, uh, the um, fairly ordinary hint that the church gives that if you can just get on the roll, you'll get to heaven. I don't believe that that works. Um, I think that the church's uh, uh, tolerance of the present economy is a very serious um, matter. And I think that uh, the language of Christianity has been fairly well deadened. For instance, uh, I think it's wrong uh, to have let Gary assume that he's a heifer couldn't go to heaven. Um, what the Bible says, in fact, is that all creatures breathe, or, uh, breathe and live by the breath and the Spirit of God. Uh, St. Paul says it even, um, that uh, the whole creation is the first revelation. And it seems to me that the church, churches have generally uh, been inclined to back away from that, as they have, against that, uh, the, the really transformative caution that we should love one another, love our neighbors, and in fact, love our enemies. I don't think that, uh, that you can come up against uh, Th those cautions be all that far from Buddhism. Um, so for a while I thought I didn't have a religion because I didn't have that kind of religion. And, uh, but then the, the, the Bible and the hymns and so on had sunk very deep into me. And, and uh, I think other people th uh, thought that I was a Christian writer before I thought I was myself. The um, Gospels themselves don't give me much pause. I, uh, I, I'm a, a believer. I mean, I, I don't. I believe in the in the Annunciation and the Nativity and the and the Resurrection. Um, uh, what, what really bothers me is when those doctrines become associated with with treasuries and treasurers and building funds and those things that ally it to an economy that's really 
fundamentally based on the, 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 the uh, seven deadly sins. <laughs> so, so whether you can be a Christian writer and not be an active member of a church is a question I'm not competent to deal with. Um, <laughs> But I know that I do, that I do require uh, religious faith because my experience includes realities that um, materialism and empiricism don't include. It, and, uh, uh, and I have uh, probably more and more consciously become a Christian writer, but with, I find the, uh, the issue of, of uh, uh, Finding language that that isn't dead it has been a, a hardship for me. I don't I don't like people uh, talking glibly about God. Uh, it seems to me that God and sex ought ought to be talked about a great deal less than they are. The intimate <laughs> things of life ought not to be talked glibly about. I used up more time than I intended to, Gary, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, my grandmother always said, don't talk about uh, religion and politics, so let's talk about politics. <laughs> um, since we're dealing here with things that aren't supposed to be talked about, um, you have both written extremely polemical poems and essays about the political issues of the day, and I think you both might agree that it's an obligation of writers to speak out. Compared with the repression and imprisonment of writers in other parts of the world, American writers have had a fairly easy time of it, and it might even be suggested that that easy time has been because American writers have been so politically ineffectual most of this past century. <laughs> but, but you both have been central, whether you like it or not, to the development of the counterculture born out of the 60s, and the political and cultural effects of that movement are ever evident everywhere in our society today. Um, Wendell, you first. Politically, can you continue and give us your sense of how you think we got where we are today, where you think you're headed, and where do you think we ought to be headed? Well, I don't think you have a right as a, as a writer to um, uh, base your work on the idea that it would be effective. Uh, I, don't, I don't, don't think you have that the expectation that you will win is, is not relevant to the work. Um, and if you're a political person, and it seems to me uh, you have to be a political person, then you, you ought to be a political writer to the extent that politics are part of your consciousness. It, uh, where we are, it seems to me, is in a uh, a situation in which we make in a fundamental confusion between symbolic value, namely money, and real value, and that the connection between the, the uh, symbols and the good symbolized has been virtually lost. So that people are now, in great, great numbers of people in power, are looking upon money as a vital sign uh, which it is not. Uh, the money is, is uh, doing well, and the things that the money is made from, in general, are doing poorly. Uh, the money is being made by um, uh, robbing the landscapes of the world and the people who work those, those uh, landscapes. And uh, so the political situation to me, as I see it, f from where I'm looking, that is a country community, uh, looks like a fairly pure uh, um, composition of fantasies. Let me ask you something about the first part of your answer, though. You said that you don't think writers should uh, worry about their effect. But I've seen you... Um, depressed and angry about many of these issues for a prolonged period of time. So you wish to have an effect. Of course you wish to have an effect. But what I mean is, <laughs> you, 
you can't do the work on the condition that you have an effect. You've got to do the work the best you can and let the effect be a byproduct or a, let, let it come if it can. Uh, I work all the time for political results and uh, I'm not, not a bit embarrassed about it. Don't feel that my art has been compromised at all by it. And uh, uh, I'm going to be at work th for the rest of my life uh, for, for political results. But I found out pretty early that if you, if you make your effort dependent upon uh, some uh, uh, presumptive success, you're going to be disappointed pretty early. And, and you can't last. We've seen, we've seen this happen a lot with young people uh, when, they, when they find themselves ineffective uh, in, the, in the, even the short run. They become discouraged and give up. Um, by the time you're my age, you don't give a damn whether you have an effect or not. You're, <laughs> you're not going to quit. Well, I think the, um, the economic um, business leads to a question for you, Gary, and, and um, uh, maybe also a sense that some of us have that the political movement has um, flattened out, if you will, in this country. Um, what did it mean to be a radical when you were growing up, and what does it mean today? And how did radicalism impact some of the political events of your lifetime that you would think of as critical or important? I was brought up in what you would call the old left. Uh, my father and his brothers, uh, from time to time doing labor organizing, uh, working in logging camps, working on ships. Uh, my father was a union organizer on Grand Coulee Dam project. At the same time, he was unemployed. Uh, <laughs> And uh, they had meetings at our house. Uh, so I was brought up with old left values, which was strong support of the labor movement, labor unionism, solidarity, and also uh, no race prejudice allowed. Anti-Semitism, race prejudice was uh, defined as not permitted in any way in the values of our family. This is in the 30s. Um, my grandfather talked a little bit about Marx and sat in a big black leather chair, pointed at me and said, read Marx, boy. <laughs> when he was younger, he had uh, occasionally done soapboxing in Yesler Square, Seattle, for the IWW. Uh, it wasn't difficult for me to c carry what I heard from those conversations and from the family attitudes uh, into seeing uh, and understanding that there was ex oppression and exploitation uh, afoot in the world. Uh, and I made my own leap, which wasn't a hard leap, uh, wasn't much of a leap, to see that there was uh, uh, exploitation of the environment taking place. Uh, because the big clear cuts were just beginning in the Cascade Mountains, uh, not far from our place. And you could see the big log trucks going down the road. Loving forests, as I did, I couldn't figure out what the justification for this might be. Uh, I guess they were building more suburbs in Los Angeles at that time. Uh, I carried those values uh, along with me and. Uh, but, um, okay, to talk about significant events. Uh, for me, si significant historical events, and I think for many of us, uh, were when I was 15 and World War II ended, to learn of uh, the horror uh, of the Nazis' uh, treatment of the Jews and of the camps. Uh, and the lesson uh, that I took from that was a deep pessimism about Western European civilization. Uh, and some questions about human nature and governments, as one might have. Uh, the second uh, turning point for me was to really get clear 
uh, about what Stalin was doing in the Soviet Union when I was about 17 or 18. Uh, and I lived in, a, in a circles in which there were a lot of defenders uh, and true believers uh, in Soviet Russia and defenders of Stalin even after the Trotsky trials. The Trotsky trials was when my, my parents dropped out of any even token support for the Soviet Union. Their roots were more uh, what in those days we called anarchist or anarcho-syndicalist. Uh, so uh, I became a very early anti-Stalinist and, and not a Trotskyite either. And uh, was thus launched on many years of, of political, of historical and political reading and thinking, trying to figure out what was going wrong, what had gone wrong, with what at one time was the great hope of the 20th century, namely socialism. And uh, the tragedy, some people say, of the 20th century is the collapse of any possible vision of socialism. So the next thing would have been, for me, uh, the end of the Cold War uh, and the launching of the global economy. Uh, with the end of the Cold War, there was no even token moral opposition aside from fundamentalist Islam, maybe, and fundamentalist Christianity, maybe, and a few other cultures and religious forces uh, to an unleashed and value-free capitalism. Uh, so that is where I think we're at now, on one level, is uh, in a post, in a world in which socialism no longer uh, uh, presents uh, a viable vision, uh, although at one time, prior to the Bolsheviks, there was another socialism uh, that was a lot more flexible and a lot more compassionate that might have taught us something, uh, but the Bolsheviks uh, destroyed that uh, deliberately nationwide through the 20s and 30s, if you look back on that history now. Uh, so there is no viable socialism in the world at the moment. So what is it that we, will, that we can bring forward uh, that can bring value, restraint, self-restraint to the energy of unleashed, institutionalized, global greed. That's what I keep thinking about right now. <laughs> uh -huh. my, my history is very different from yours, Gary, but um, that's what I'm thinking about right now. I, I grew up in an agrarian family in, in, uh, in agrarian politics. My father's great effort was to keep a viable life for the small farmers. I'd never heard of socialism. Um, agrarianism, I thought was normal. It turns out that's fairly radical. Um, but what, when I was a young man, it just, I was possessed with the idea that I'd like to be a writer. And uh, it wasn't until I came back to Kentucky and, and right into the beginning of the strip, miner, the strip mining operations in eastern Kentucky that I saw that, and then the Vietnam War, of course, that uh, if I didn't want to be blamable for these things, I'd have to get against them. And that was when I began to be a kind of a political uh, radical. But then, then, I mean, our course sort of converges, converges yeah. it seems to me.